sounds disgusting. It'll work. All right. Now, um, this is a motor oil thing, and I'm going to do everything I can to make this not boring. Okay. Um, of course, if, you, if you're easily bored anyway, suck it up. All right, motor oil essential and some trivia. Time for a few surprises here. Now, this is some stuff that you just, I want you to burn it in because I've talked to somebody, some of you guys have learned about this before. Institute of American Petroleum Institute Program certifies that all meets a certain original equipment manufacturer quality and performance standard, your API. That's it. And the service rating is shown in the API service symbol donut. Now, I want you guys to remember this. You see the donut. There's your API. And then there's your SAE. So you've got two different things there. S would be for spark fired engines, and the farther up the alphabet, the second letter is, the better the wall. In other words, if, if this is the farther away from A this is, the better the oil is. S is spark fired. If there was a C right there, there would be compression fired. Now, some people will say this means service, and, and the other, and the C means commercial, commercial. Commercial. But I don't know about that. I've never really heard that in one place. Uh, everywhere else, I heard spark fired and compression fired. As the SAE defines a numerical system for great motor oils according to the viscosity, and the suffix is 0, 5, 10, 15, and 25, followed by the letter W, designate the winter grade of an engine oil. So W stands for winter, not weight. You want to remember that? Yeah. W stands for winter, not weight. Old timers will argue with you about that. They think it stands for weight just because weight starts with W. But viscosity is what we're after on that. Okay. So, is it the correct viscosity? Weight is what I call that. Fuller synthetic blend, correct API or SAE rating. What else we need to know? High mileage oil has got additives in it that soften seals to sort of mitigate oil leaks because seals tend to get hard over time. And so you put high mileage oil in there, it's supposed to soften the seals just a little bit. It's got chemicals in there to do that. One multi weight 5W30 oil may be thicker or thinner than another, so make sure you choose wisely. Seems like it'll all be the same, doesn't it? Well, this is more about oil specs that go beyond the velocity of the oil. So smaller displacement engines with higher rivets, increased temperatures, tighter tolerances, turbochargers. Turbochargers spend 100,000 RPM, and those bearings have got to be lubricated really well. Uh, more exotic materials, metallurgy can have a lot of influence. So you pay attention to all the specs. Make doggone sure that when you're getting an oil, you don't just grab a quart of oil and dump it in there. Like, for example, the lady that drives across her crossfire out there, her takes a full synthetic oil for the specific specifications of it, and it takes nine quarts. But her oil changes are supposed to be 10,000 miles in between. And anyway, the long and the short of it is, if you just grab some oil or put the wrong oil in it, and the engine fails, and they find out you put the wrong oil in it, or they can determine you did, then you know it's on you. So make sure you use the right oil. It's really important. Not all oils are created equal. Repeated analysis of the oil that's been drained from the same vehicle is an important indicator of the wear that's happening in an engine. Now, you know, this is an oil analysis lab thing, like you can, you know, portable when you can get. Blackstone Laboratories is a place you can send off your oil and have them analyze it and look and see what's in there. You know, whenever it comes out of your engine, it's going to have some materials in it that came from the engine, and there's some materials that were in the oil that was part of the mixed oil. I mean, part of the uh, additives. There are companies that provide the service, and you can buy the equipment, but it's kind of expensive. And there's a couple of companies in the oil analysis lab. So, why are some oils so much more expensive? You've got different base stock, different levels of additives, different manufacturing processes, but uh, the differences have a meaningful effect on how an engine is wearing. All right, here's what the numbers look like. Here's, what, here's where, you know, scuffle on the side of the piston. You might notice a lot of pistons got graphite on the side of them. And you got worn out bearings here. All right, so these metals right here, aluminum, chromium, iron, copper, and lead, are the ones that are actually showing wear of the engine. Any of this stuff right here that, that they come back in the oil will tell you that, you know, certain parts of the engine are wearing. And these are elements are all out of it. Molybdenum, boron, sodium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, zinc. There may be a couple more in there. The count is the number of samples of each oil type. Miles is the average oil change interval for that engine oil. And so if you've got an average, on there, you got aluminum would be this much, uh, the kind of oil percentage in there, and then iron, uh, which iron is your, you know, engine block and all that kind of stuff. Lead, your bushings and your rod bearings, iron cylinder liners, ring, crankshaft, camshaft, rod and valve train, oil pump gear, wrist pins, cast iron component, and components of gear. Aluminum is kind of pistons, main rod bearings, but 
you know, pumps, thrust bearings, washers. Some of the oil pumps are, have got aluminum, got metal parts that are spinning inside aluminum too. Uh, silica. If it's got silica in it, that means there's dirt in there. Soft uh, metals, copper, main and rod bearings, oil cooler, so on and so forth. Chromium is hard metal from piston rings, lanterns, exhaust valves, shaft plating, roller bearings, needle bearings. See, this is bearings and stuff here. Tin is usually found in bearings, brass, bronze, bushing, flashing from pistons. And then you got nickel, which is uh, valves, crankshaft, camshaft bearings, and shafts. Calcium, magnesium, and sodium are detergent dispersant additives. It means that basically what you're wanting the stuff to do is keep the stuff suspended. Right? And don't let it settle out. You want to keep it suspended at all. Provide some alkalinity to help neutralize acids formed from diesel fuel combustion. I had heard a long time ago, and I don't know with all of the new formulations and everything, that there was a special oil filter they were selling. They were saying 90% or 95% of the wear in an engine was due to sulfuric acid content that builds up in the oil. You know, acid starts taking things apart. Basically, just too alkaline it will too. But the alkalinity is acid is where it heads, and alkalinity alkalinity is the opposite of acid. Do you know what pH is, right? I don't like the pH scale. I mean, about the pH level, as opposed to acid for alkaline, zero, right? Water is at seven. The farther down away from water you go, the more acid it is. The farther up from water you go, you know, the higher the number, the more alkaline it is. A Coca-Cola is at 2.1. That's the acidity. Battery acid is at 1.0. So you can put a T-bone steak in a bowl of Coca-Cola, and it'll be gone in two days. That's crazy. crazy. Yeah. Think about it. You're drinking battery acid, guys. Okay. All right. So why don't it... It does. Okay. Sodium also helps to disperse heat. All right. Zinc, phosphorus, and boron are anywhere additives, and molybdenum is a friction modifier. It's just a few little things. It is, you know, just give you a little rundown on it. So, what percentage of new oil is additives? Between 15 and 25 percent of the oil is stuff they've added to it to make it better. You got that? Viscosity intakes and improvers, disperses to prevent sludge. Pore point depressant, anti-foaming additives, detergents to prevent acid formation, rust and corrosion inhibitors, antioxidants and anti-wear agents to reduce wear under heavy load and high temperature. Antioxidants are needed to slow down the main cause of lubricant degradation in the engine, which is the breakdown of the base stop due to oxygen and heat. And oxidation of the base stop causes acid formation that leads to corrosion and sludge blocked oil flow. Another thing that causes sludge is if you're running the engine too cold, in other words, you know, grandma and grandpa live a half a mile from a store and they crank it up and they drive to the store and they don't even let it get warm. They crank it up and they drive it right back and don't even let it get warm. Over a long period of time, granny and grandma have got a car that ain't got no rattles because they don't ever go nowhere on it, but the engine has got all this sledge caked on the inside of it. If the PCV system ain't working right or if it wasn't designed right, such as in this Toyota engine from about 2000, they were replacing a lot of engines, usually like a, a dealership, if an engine is really bad sledged up on the inside, they'll just replace the engine. Because replacing the engine is cheaper than tearing the engine all the way down, getting the sledge out of it, and putting it back together. If you figure labor and everything else in there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But you just pop the engine back in there, you know. Now if this was a labor of love and you were working on your own car and you had your own labor and you had your own time and you knew what you were doing. You might want to go ahead and tear an engine down and get all the sludge out of it and clean it all up and put it back together just for fun of it. Back in the day, these old hot water V8 engines of the 60s and 70s would do just fine with just about any oil you poured in them. They weren't really choosy, but in the 60s at 100,000 miles, most engines were considered to be used up. Back in the 1930s, you had to have piston rings replaced about every 10,000 miles. All right. Today's engines are more choosy about their oil and they last longer too. That uh, white Pontiac out there, I was telling somebody this morning, that car was donated uh, to this department by this lady years ago. And she said it had a blown head gasket. Well, I ain't ever seen a blown head gasket on that thing. It's got 250,000 miles on it and it runs like a brand new car. As far as the engine, it's just as smooth. I think you were talking about all of us out there whenever you were talking about that. I was just a few minutes ago. I mean, before, uh, we went to lunch. before these Delta guys got here. What's this thing right here? It's a supercharger. That's a supercharger. What's the difference between a supercharger and a turbocharger? The intake, the way it works, like turbos, they, um, I'm trying to think. it's like it forces it. 
turbos use more gas up, and then uh, turbos you get to do more to them before you can put it on. Uh, Superchargers you can usually just bolt it on. You need to get a different belt. But, uh, wow, it's the way it's, they work. You've got me confused. Okay, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what the mount, what it amounts to is a supercharger driven by a belt. Yeah. Like that right there, and it doesn't spin as fast. Furthermore, the supercharger, like this, they've got their own oil supply. Every 30,000 miles, you're supposed to check the oil. Got a little place there, you screw the plug out and see if it's just that oil. Um, the turbocharger is operated by exhaust. So you got an impeller, and you got a turbine. See, and then whenever the exhaust goes through there, it whips that thing up. In other words, the shaft is between both of them, and when it's spinning it really fast, it's going to for both of them force the it's a force the in there. And I'll tell you something else too, what's peculiar about these, a lot of the time like on the Thunderbirds and stuff, this is on a, one of those uh, uh, Lincolns, I mean Mercury's Marauders is what this is. But anyway, on the on the Thunderbirds, the, the air went in underneath it, come out the top, went through the intercooler, and then went around the back, went back in the engine. <laughs> the intercooler cools it after it squeezes it and heats it up. All right, but anyway, the viscosity is the oil's resistance to flow via gravity at a particular temperature. The higher the number, the greater the resistance. You know the difference between a mayonnaise and ketchup? Yeah. When you pour ketchup, you know, once you finally get it broke loose and it squirts all over your burger. Yeah. One day we were eating, and uh, there's all kinds of different way, tricks people come up with to get the ketchup to start flowing out of the bottle, you know? And this uh, front end mechanic was sitting across from me at the steakhouse over there. We were eating dinner one day, and I says, he was, trying to shake that ketchup <laughs> and I said, here, let me show you how to do that. Somebody showed me this and I got the bottle and I held it toward his burger and I went, Poop, and it went all over his shirt. Thanks, he says. I didn't know that was going to happen. Okay. Ketchup would have a lower viscosity number than mayonnaise. There's ketchup and mayonnaise right there. Multi-viscosity, like 5W30, the colder something is, the thicker it is. With a multi-weight of all, all that thing is can be changed to vary with temperature so it's not too thick when it's cold and it's not too thin when it's hot. So you know, they got 5W30, those are your two numbers up there. 5W30 is as thin as 5 weight of all when it's measured at minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit and as thick as 30 weight of all when it's measured at 212. Okay? So you want to be there and get the optimum use across all these things. Why is it a problem for the oil to be too thick when it's really cold? It's harder to turn the motor over. It's harder for the oil pump to pick it up and get everything lubricated. Because it's moving so damn dumb slow. You want it to move good and fast whenever it does all that. Remember I was telling you guys the other day, I could take an oil pump back there, one of these oil pumps is driven by the distributor, stick that thing down in a uh, can of oil, you know, with the, the pressure port pointing up. You can spin that thing with your fingers, it'll squirt oil from here to that oil over there. Just by one spin of your fingers. And pew! And I was going to you know, get out there one day and demonstrate this to the students, and I stuck it in there. You know, this it made a big mess. And I didn't expect. I figured it would go like this, you know, but it shot all the way up over here. The W stands for winter, not weight. I talked about that before. Now, their hidden viscosity number is the rating of the oil printed on the oil is contained in the oil's resistance to pouring. Now, the other viscosity rate is not printed, and the oil's resistance to being stirred. What's your crankshaft doing? Got your old oil pan full of oil? It's having to stir it, right? Whenever it spins around. Now the oil pump picks it up and pressurizes it, but there's a lot of splash going on in there too. And also, if you're looking to try to, try to figure out an oil leak, you got to determine if it's a pressure leak or a splash oil leak. If it's splashing against the pan and going out by the gasket, that's a different leak than it's squirting out of a pressure, uh, you know, from a pressure gallery somewhere. Oil life monitors. There's oil life monitors are mileage based, and that's an electronic oil change sticker. All it is. Then there's the monitors that measure the mileage and modify the warning trigger by time and temperature. But on short trips that don't operate the engine long enough to evaporate moisture can cause sludge, acid, corrosion, ready to all break down. And these two types aren't that trustworthy. One day there was a guy, back in the day, whenever Ford built an engine, they painted everything gray. And uh, the oil filter was gray too. Didn't have any numbers on it or anything. Whenever they got through painting, it was all gray. So this guy came in and he had a F-150 with a Drink six in it, that he bought brand new, and it had 36,000 miles on it, and the engine was locked up. So when we pulled the oil pan off of it, the oil looked like tar. You could stand a screwdriver up in it. And the oil filter was still gray. He had never changed the oil, 36,000 miles. He just drove it until it locked up. And he wanted it fixed under warranty. 
Okay. All right. The monitor that is trustworthy would be the Ford 6 L power stroke gentle higher amount in luxury vehicle. They have used an oil quality sensor. It's a really good way to do that. Now, it, it's good. It's a good idea to know what kind of oil monitor you got because you can't always trust it to give you good information about when you need your next oil change. Okay, that's the point. Synthetic oil has got superior low temperature properties, higher temperature stability, lower volatility, higher longer oil life. Responded better to additives compared to mineral oil. Now, the lower friction uh, nature with synthetic oil results in higher fuel economy compared to the same way to mineral oil. So it makes things slipperier. In an engine that's working like it's supposed to, the bearings should never make contact with the crankshaft. You know, the polished crankshaft journals? The, the, that metal should never touch. The oil should always be in between there. Okay? Whenever synthetic oil is required, use them. My pickup truck uses seven quarts of Motorcraft synthetic blend, and this is a 4.2 V6. Not all that special about it. That's what I pour in it. Always err on the side of caution. Be careful to use it right off. Going cheap is not good if it causes later engine failure. This is the sort of thing you will see sooner or later. You're looking at that, yeah. right? That's an outstanding performance engine. Don't you just love that kind of thing? Yeah. All right. Oil analysis story. This guy saw a picture on the video online of that oil analysis and decided to give it a try. So he got his first report back, noticed excess aluminum, didn't think too much of it. Later that year, he sent another sample, showed the aluminum nearly double, twice as much aluminum. When he sent the final sample early the following year, it came back with a lot of aluminum in it, and he realized that he couldn't hear or see any problems. He needed to get that checked out. Think about it. He was getting data that most of us never see. Usually we drain the oil, we just see it run out in there, we pour more oil in, we be aight, you know, send it on out of there. And always make sure that you pour the oil in it before you start the car, okay? You got that? All right. What he discovered, he took his vehicle to a repair shop and explained the situation to the service advisor. He said, I don't think it's a problem. It's only got 109,000 on it, it runs really good. So he asked them to use a boroscope to look at the timing chain. He got a call back, and the guy said, the timing chains in this vehicle are war slam out. And if it comes apart the wrong way, bend valves, tear the motor all up, catastrophic engine failure. You see how that nylon wears off and it starts digging into that aluminum? Here's film car trivia. Dukes of Hazard went through 10 Dodge Chargers per episode. They had 75 on hand. They were constantly refurbishing. I remember you telling me one about this story one time. Gone in 60 seconds, did a 45-minute car chase, and they only used one Mustang. Well, wait, wait, wait. Because they, they Yeah, must. they that's used 10 Dodge Chargers per episode in Dukes of Hazard. Because they were always jumping stuff, messing it up, and always messing yep. it the front up. And uh, gone in 60 seconds, did a 45-minute car chase, and they only used one Mustang. I've never seen it. That's that's something about well, stuff. if you haven't ever seen it, you have missed something. If you like car chases and movies, and 1974 Gone in 60 Seconds was one of the coolest car chase I movies. I watched the Hazard Yeah, I figured you probably said Duke the Hazard, but <laughs> you can find this on YouTube, this Maybe movie. Yet? Yeah, it was a really good movie. It came out in 74. Here's some more trivia. Charles Bronson and Mr. Majestic, this Ford truck. I saw this movie too. He used in that film was not modified to do the stunts. I think I've seen that. It was a stock truck. Ford Motor Company used clips from a movie and television commercials to demonstrate how tough their trucks are. They were jumping and everything. That's just crazy. like you see right there. That was a, you can, I think you can probably find that movie on YouTube, too. But, I think I've seen that movie before. Seriously? I think I have. Yeah. Okay, what did, what would, what did he what did he sell, Mr. Majestic? It's been a while, but I think I've seen it. Watermelons. He was a watermelon farmer. He was a tough guy, too. Anyway, note the sagging bed on the left. Notice both these trucks on the left are the same shop one day. I took both uh, few photos. I took this picture, stepped over and took this picture. All right. See this one here? Can you see that one sagging in the middle? Mm -hmm. Can you see that one not sagging? Look closer. See the sag? That one's got a in it. No. See that one? Oh, it's got, that one's got little step up stills on it. That was, that, that was drooping in the back. Betty and I know the tire store over there. Somebody brought uh, one of this brands of truck in there, and when they raised it up on the lift, it broke it in half. Ooh. And his insurance had to buy another frame. But the guy had a bunch of weight in the back of it. When he raised it up, it just broke the frame. 
So happened too. That and he raised it up the same way he does every other car on the lift, you know. So having that much weight in the back and putting it on the lift would snap. Not a good thing. Would snap Not a good back. thing with one of these. How would All that right. happen? Huh? Why would it happen like because that? Because the frame is weak. Oh. All right. Back to the wall. Dilution from overly rich mixtures, use of unauthorized additives, severe driving styles. I guarantee you these fast and furious guys need to change their oil very regularly. <laughs> Any of those factors can break down the oil value of package, render the oil less effective, and start to destroy the engine's innards. And there's a weird stuff like phantom engine ground issues that lead to micro arc. That occurs when a bad ground of the engine causes moving parts inside the engine that don't normally act as a ground to do so with a little arc. And it damages the metal a little bit. In the oil pan and oil gallery, the arc shears the carbon chain length, and now you've got incorrect viscosity of oil. So the length of the carbon chain got to do with the viscosity. But you can change your oil viscosity with having these little micro arcs in there. That's why it's really important to make sure you got it grounded good. Here's a sad story. This guy right here is a friend of mine. He says, uh, he's a guy that I know on Facebook that, that writes for technical articles like I do. But anyway, I still perform most all the warranty service, including blue bull and filter on the vehicle in my household. I have a 2013 Malibu Eco hybrid stop start, belt alternator starter. So we're now well past the 100,000 mile mark in spite of the highway miles. I should have changed oil more often. The voice of common sense and technical reasons said, don't follow that oil life monitor like an uninformed consumer. Now this guy's really sharp. He knows a heck of a lot of stuff. I followed that OLM, that oil life monitor, to a degree, but never get below 40%. See? You're not supposed to wait until it gets to zero. Do you wait until you're completely out of gas before you get, put gas in your truck? Mm -hmm. I wait to it's not smart. I wait to My wait. wife has me to gas her truck up before she gets down to three quarters of a tank. Mine is like the one before, you know, the one before you get to eat. That's how far I let mine get to. <laughs> yeah, well, you do what you got to do, I guess. You know what's wrong with, with running your gas tank really low on gas all the time? Mm -hmm. Water condenses in there and then it droops into the bottom and you want a bunch of water in your tank and all of a sudden one day you're getting bucking and jumping because you got water in your tank because you ran at low on gas. Stop doing that. <laughs> all right, I lowered, well, he I says, I lowered my head in professional shame and prayed for engine longevity grace. That's David Hobbs. Dave Hobbs, rather. Excuse me. The GDI high pressure pump is basically there's a pump in the tank that puts 80 pounds or so of pressure up to the high pressure pump which is driven by this, these three cam, some of them will have a four cam on the end of the cam shaft, and that pump's pumping. It's got a solenoid right here so the PCM can control the high fuel pressure. Okay, so you got to think about how hard this pump's working. That pump, if you hold one in your hand, it feels like a heavy brick because it's really, really thick. Okay, so this is going to produce your high pressure fuel that goes to the GDI, gasoline direct injection. Using the wrong kind of oil is a nasty business when it wears the lobes off on his camshaft and messes the pump. All right, so the ticking started because he had gone 11,000 miles without an oil change, but he was watching his oil life monitor, thought he was okay. The ticking was the timing chain and the follower with a few pieces that ended up in the pan. After that, the knocking started. Loud crankshaft main bearing knocking. Uh, he says it went away when it was discovered the GDI pump cam follower went worn down from that neglect. See how that worn that cam out? And that into that pump right there. There's that solenoid that I was talking about on there. All right. Also used the wrong oil. The oil he had on hand was Mobile One with ACEA instead of ILSAC GF5 on the back. So just because it says Mobile One, does if you don't have the right specs on it, you're not doing yourself any favor. See? And the GM Dexos logo was nowhere to be found. He was using the wrong oil. So he screwed up two ways. You know? He got an engineer and he's pretty sharp. Yeah. All right. Here's a few good tips. One, always use the right oil. Two, don't trust the electronic oil change reminder. Three, always warm the engine up before shutting it off. And four, repair P05, what P125 and 128 codes? Those Two. oil change codes? No, not oil change codes. <laughs> that was a good guess. It means the engine's running too cold and it needs a thermostat. Mm -hmm. Unless it's a Toyota Camry and it could need an oxygen sensor for that. Go figure. But anyway, I, I, more about that later. But anyway, a PO125 or a 128 code points you to an engine that's either, it's not getting completely warm, either the thermostat stuck wide open or it's opening too early, depending on which one of those codes you got. Now tell me you didn't learn something. I gave a test in here one time. 
and fundamentals. Basically told a story, looking at it from the service advisor's point of view, the mechanic's point of view, the parts guy's point of view, and the customer's point of view, the same situation. And this one guy came in there and I said, did you learn something from reading this? Because I was grading them on what they, were, what they learned from it, you know? Everybody that's ever taken that test said, yeah, I learned this, this, and this from it. That one guy says, had no use for this, didn't learn anything from it. I said, okay, you got a D. <laughs> See, I was holding all the cards. <laughs> you tell me you didn't learn something? <laughs> Don't tell me you didn't learn nothing, because I know you did. Yeah. All right. Anybody got any questions or comments?